Welcome friends to Talking Grace. This is Frank speaking, your host. Uh, as you've been following my journey, you've been coming to see, uh, we've been tackling this idea that there are two separate gods in the Bible. Uh, there is the Father, who is the only true God, and there was Jehovah. Now that might be a little bit confusing if you haven't heard any of my previous discussions I asked you to go back and have a look but as I as I've been going through these topics we've been sort of contrasting the two gods as it were the father that Jesus revealed and Jehovah God himself Yahweh uh, as many Christians uh, believe that he is the father that Jesus revealed to the nation of Israel who had no clue that that he was revealing the father which they thought they already knew who he was that was Jehovah so we're sort of we've been going down this track so what I want to do today is look at the the voices of God now in the Bible the two voices, two separate voices, and how can we learn it? We, we've been looking at actions. We've been looking at actions, looking at their deeds, and contrasting one from the other and saying, you know, if you're saying that the one God is the one God, then he's a bit of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, a legalist uh, type, war-hungry type sort of a God, right? Um, and the Father is all loving, no evil about him. And so what I found interesting when I was doing this part, which we calling it a time to hate, and then there's the time to love. It seems we're having to decide what we should be doing. Should we be hating or should we be loving? right Jesus tells us to be loving and yet we're also told to hate so we're confused it can be a little bit confusing right which action do I take should I be hating or should I be loving should I be a peacemaker or a troublemaker depending on the circumstances so what I want to do is rightly divide the word now if you believe there is one god right if you believe there is one god that jehovah is the father if that's what you believe i believed it for many years but if you believe that now that's still that your belief after looking at all these videos we've been doing then there's no point in rightly dividing the word as paul said why would you rightly divide the word why even make that statement? Why even test inspired words if it is all from God? Should we be testing the Old Testament God and the apostles and Jesus? Should we even test their words? No. Not according to the theology if you believe there is just one God. But if you don't, but if you subscribe to the truthfulness of the apostles and Jesus then really we should be then saying well why are they saying to rightly divide why do they want us to test every inspired expression is there a reason for it somebody's home who's home who's home <laughs> that's my bird every time my daughter comes she makes a noise <clears throat> so so this topic is of interest a time to hate and a time to love and the two voices of God love is good we say right this is what we probably all were taught growing up love is good and hate is bad but as you start to learn the Bible uh, as a believer you start to see that it's not so simple as that is it the uh, the writer in Ecclesiastes says this: there is a time to hate, 
a time to hate. I remember seeing a uh, Bud Spencer. I forget the other guy's name. It was called uh, My Name Is Trinity. It's a Western movie, and uh, these guys were rough, rough, uh, rough around the edges. These two, and they joined a, a church group, and they were being harassed by the Mexicans, and uh, they were pacifists. They wouldn't get involved in any fighting, and these two wanted to fight, right? So they read this passage. And the pastor read this passage, or the preacher read this passage to the group, to the congregation. And he said, brothers, the Lord says it's a time to hate and a time to fight. There's a passage that says a time to fight. Anyway, it's in that same passage. But a time to hate. When and why would that be? Who or what would that include? I'm just going to read to you without sort of separating the gods just as you would believe as you are you believe this one god two th two covenants right the old covenant new covenant same god jehovah is the same god right the father is jehovah yahweh yhwh the old and the new i'm not going to change this To, to see the two separate voices. See if you can determine the two separate voices. Think about God, the Father. What is He like? Jesus said He's good, loving, etc. There's no darkness in Him. He doesn't tempt anyone with evil. And then think of what you know about Jehovah, right? So see if you can work this out. Then we'll break it down in another section. So the questions we want to ask is, when and why would that be? That is the time to hate. Who who and what would that include? For example, would it be appropriate to hate a fellow believer? Not according to John, 1 John 4.20, which says, If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar, for he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Huh. You hear what he's saying? How can you say you hate your brother and say you love God whom you have not seen? No one's ever seen God. If you believe God is Jesus, that wouldn't make sense either, would it? So that's an interesting statement straight up. Is it all right to hate one's enemies? What about that question? In Matthew 5:44, Jesus said, "Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that dis despitefully use you and persecute you." That's the King James version. In fact, God's people were told not to rejoice even when their enemies fell. For example, in Proverbs 24:17-18 says this, "Do not gloat when your enemy falls." when they stumble do not let your heart rejoice or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them that's the New International Version additionally Proverbs 17 5 warns those who rejoice at the misfortune of others will be punished New Living Translation if that's the case when would hate ever be a good thing well, Psalm 97, 10 says, Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Hate evil? Yes. Hate evil. First of all, who decides what is evil? If our aim is to please our Heavenly Father, would it be God's view that matters? For example, Proverbs 6, 16-19 says this. Maybe you've heard of this. There are six things in which the Lord hates. Yes, seven that are hated by Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill those who, without guilt, a heart that makes sinful plans, feet that run fast to sin, a person who tells lies about someone else, and one who starts fights among brothers. If these things are that God hates, how should we feel about them? Should we share the sentiments written at Proverbs 8.13? If you respect the Lord, 
you will hate evil. I hate pride and conceit and deceitful lies. Do you hate what God hates? Is that how you want to feel about that? If you truly want to, but you honestly don't, ask yourself, why would this form of hatred be a good thing? Do you think hating evil pre might prevent you from practicing things that God hates? Can it cause us to turn aside from bad the way we would back away from an edge of a steep cliff? Maybe so. Another example of God's view of evil is found in Psalm 11.5. We've read this one before, but let's read it again, where it says, Those who love violence, he hates with a passion. So now God hates those who love violence, and he hates them with a passion. Should we rethink our views on violence? Even as a form of sport or entertainment? Some love watching violence or engaging in violent activities. They don't really want to hate what God hates. Remember, God hates people that love violence. Evil people, wicked people, some other translations put it. They don't really want to hate what God hates, these people. It's easy to say we love God, but... If we don't hate what God hates, it raises some serious questions, doesn't it? Romans 12, 9 says, Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. New Living Translation. So how can we develop a hatred for what's wrong if we really enjoy it? One important way is by considering the consequences that doing bad often brings. None of us can escape that, obviously. Um, we know that principle in Galatians 6 7 about reaping what we sow. A, a truism, a universal law, if you like, uh, and you, there's no way of getting around it. There is absolutely no way. Some say karma, it's karma. Karma's a bitch, right? Whatever it is, there's no way you can bend these laws. So maybe developing a real disgust for what is wrong can be a protection against breaking laws and if you like god's laws especially if you're following god's laws depending what they are according to your religion and your view of what what you should be following while the bible condemns hating one's enemies what about a person who like the angel who rebelled and became saint and the devil Knew, knew God, but truly hate God. What about the devil? He hates Yahweh, doesn't he? So I'm, I'm, I'm talking now like a one God theology. This is how you would say it, right? At Psalm 139, would, would you hate the devil? Do you hate the devil? At Psalm 139... 21 and 22, David said, O Lord, how I hate those who hate you. How I despise those who rebel against you. I hate them with a total hatred. I regard them as my enemies. What about you? Do you feel that way? See, David tolerated people who hated him, like King Saul, better than he tolerated Peter, people who hated Jehovah God, or Yahweh, or YHWH. Still, his hatred did not cause him to go out of his way to harm anyone, or did it? It was not aggressive or violent. It protected him from sympathizing or fraternizing with God's enemies. Do you agree with that? Clearly, life is not as simple as saying love is good or hate is bad. End of story. Not all love is good and not all hatred is bad. Hatred for for things God considers bad can really be good for us. Here's another one. Jesus mentioned another form of hate in Luke 14, 26. He said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this the context is important in understanding what Jesus is saying here. But according to the New American Standard Greek and Hebrew Study Bible, the Greek word translated hate is not always as we think it is. 
um, it's the it's the Greek word misio and can also mean to love less. Surely to, to book God first, we must learn to hate or love less all others. We know that Jesus loved his mother, didn't he? See that on the cross where there was John and he said, He, I entrust my mother to you. We know the Bible talks about, Paul talks about honoring your mother and father. So we don't think Jesus is referencing a hatred to your own family members, though there would be a division to those who would accept Jesus, because why? Well, they were Jews, right? Serving Yahweh under a covenant. For them to walk away from that covenant and follow Jesus, even if he was the Messiah, but as we know, they rejected him as the Messiah. That is, the religious leaders, the the people that mattered, rejected him as a Messiah to the community at large. Because they rejected him, everyone else would have rejected him, primarily everyone else. So this was going to be a cause of a problem within the community regardless. But he's not telling anyone to not love his, not love their parents. That wouldn't be correct. But in this instance, it would be better, as the as the uh, translation means, can mean to love less. So if we are working at loving what God loves and hating what God hates, we align ourselves with anyone applying the words of Psalm 45, 7. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. English Standard Version. I have not changed. I've not tried to persuade you to believe one thing or another. That's how I would have just... We would have just read that in the past without rightly dividing the word and trying to figure out who's speaking there. There are um, instances in that um, discussion that I've just had with you that are from the Father and that are from Yahweh, I believe. Two separate instances. There are separate voices that you're hearing. So what I'm going to do from here on in is introduce to you in a way that we can sort of see the two voices of God. God small g and big g right small g and big g we'll, we'll rightly divide the word so we can avoid wrong thinking of the father and terrible consequences that come isaiah five twenty says this woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Mark three twenty-eight to 30 says this, Verily I say to you, that all the sins shall be forgiven to the sons of men, and evil speakings, which they might speak evil. But whoever may speak evil in regards to the Holy Spirit has not, has not forgiveness to this age, but is in danger of age during judgment, because they said he has an unclean spirit uh, we can talk about all that later on in some some places um, yeah quite interesting Matthew 12 31 to 32 because of this I say to you all sin and evil speaking shall be forgiven to men but the evil speaking of the spirit shall not be forgiven to men and whoever may speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven to him. But whoever may speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this age nor in which it is to come. For example, we're going to look at um, some of these cases where we'll see two voices of God, the separating of the voices of God, will be that of Yahweh, Jehovah, YHWH, killing King David's baby as a punishment. Um, Jehovah killing 70,000 men for King David's sin. 
the Redeemer from wrath versus the bowl of wrath in Revelation. So we, we must rightly divide the word. Honestly, to get a sense of this, we must test the spirits and spirits to rightly divide the word. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all, over all creation. Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of the glory, the express image of his person. 1 John 4.1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Notice, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent uh, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hebrews 5.12-14 For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who partakes of the milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason, use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you're still not able. Isn't that amazing? Even up until then, these bre brethren could not receive spiritual food. Solid food, that is. They were still feeding milk. And this is what happens as you start to grow in Christ. Um, we can either grow so that we can receive deeper food, more deeper understanding, or we'll just remain at a certain level. And that's okay, but it's, it's still sort of almost like milkish level. Romans 3, 5 and 6 says this, But if our righteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? If I speak as a man, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? So we're going to look now. That's just sort of uh, opening up there, that discussion. So we need to, we're encouraged to grow, rightly divide, be mature, learn to discern right from wrong, hate what, you know, what is love and what is hate, who is it coming from, is it of God or is it not of God. So we're going to look at animal sacrifices, abomination or sweet aroma. Which one is it, these animal sacrifices to, to Jehovah? Here's a good voice in the in in the past in the Old Testament. Psalm 51:16 says this. So this is God's voice, we could say. See, the the Bible writers wouldn't know when they received a message from God, because they never heard His voice nor seen Him, the Father that is. But they seen Jehovah, they knew who Jehovah was and heard His voice. But we we want want to rightly divide, right? This is what we're trying to do. Here's, here's, here's a couple of examples of God's good voice. And you'll start to see some patterns like this in the Old Testament. Psalm 51, 16. For you do not desire sacrifice. Underline that. For you do not desire sacrifice. Or else I would give it. Remember what Samuel said to Saul? You do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. He doesn't delight in burnt offering. And he doesn't want sacrifice. Otherwise, David said he would give it. Isn't that interesting? Wasn't he the king? 
didn't he know what was going on in that nation with sacrifices Isaiah 66 3 he who kills a bull is as if he slays a man he who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck he who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood he who burns incense as if he blesses an idol just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations yeah, isn't that interesting i mean you can read that again in your own time isaiah 66 3 it goes against everything that you know about the nation of israel and their sacrifices does it not here's what jesus uh, jesus said and the father himself who sent me has testified of me he said this you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form okay that's very important to get that because in the old testament they had not seen or heard the father they were getting messages but they weren't seeing him and so these were the this is why the, there was a, a mixing you know they were just writing down not knowing actually that this was some of these words were going against Yahweh and his commands right without realizing it and they're writing it down okay and they're actually writing what the father is about to this nation so this would have been confusing to the nation of Israel if they were hearing these words from these prophets see they would have been a little bit confused well, I mean what do you want us to do <laughs> do you want us to offer sacrifice or not I mean what's King David saying right I mean which page is he, is he on you see it so this is how we can tell these are when you read stuff like that you start to see a picture of the good father but now we're going to go and listen to some evil thoughts. This is not from the Father. This is strictly from Yahweh. Uh, they're contradictory. Exodus 29, 41-42 And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning for a sweet aroma. An offering made by fire to the Lord. 42. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord, where I'll meet you to speak with you. Huh. What did Jesus say? You have never heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Here in Exodus, Yahweh saying, We're going to have a meeting. You're going to have continual burnt offering throughout your generations. Here, and this is where we're going to meet. Right here. And you just read in Psalms and Isaiah that he hates, so he hates this uh, burnt offering sacrifices. And David says, I wouldn't even do that because I know you don't want it. You don't delight in it. You see it? Exodus 29, 16 and 18. Here's another evil thought. Not from a good voice. From the, the other, small g. Small g's voice. Exodus 29, 16 and 18. And you shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all over the altar. And you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma. An offering made by fire to the Lord. Sweet aroma. There's something sweet about it. He loves it. He loves these sacrifices. Uh, he wants you to do it. Now, we talked about Yahweh, Jehovah, YHWH, killing a baby to punish King David. You know the story, but let's have a read of it. He, this is what he says in Ezekiel. The soul who sins shall die. Notice, the soul that sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father. 
nor the father bear the guilt of the son right so the son shall not bear the guilt of the father you, you, you get it this is what he's saying nor the nor bear the guilt of the son the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself but if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right he shall surely live he shall not die none of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done he shall live do i have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die says the lord god and not that he should turn from his ways and live exodus 20:14 you shall not commit adultery now let's have a look at acts 10:38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him Matthew 18 10 take heed that you do not despise one of the little ones for I say to you that in heaven their angels who see my who see the face of my father who is in heaven now, with that background in mind and those thoughts, Second Samuel eleven three fifteen says this. Um, I'm not going to read the whole lot, but just parts. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, "Is that is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite?" Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him. And he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. And 15, and he wrote in the letter, saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the bat hottest battle, and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. So this is the way David, after trying to get um, Uriah to sleep with his wife brought him back from home from the battle try to sleep with Bathsheba so he could cover over this child um, and but in the end wouldn't work because he was loyal and then he had this death sentence put upon Uriah a murderer he basically murdered this guy committed adultery he murders right second Samuel 12:19 says this uh, with Nathan why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight you have killed Uriah the Hittite with the with a sword you have taken his wife to be your wife and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity. Now this word means evil. Adversity means evil. Against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of, his, of this son. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that the Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. That is how he does these things. He became ill. He struck him. He did that with Moses. Remember in Exodus chapter 4, where he confronted Moses? He struck him with a, an, an illness to get him sick. And he was dying. Remember? And his wife had to um, commit, um, cut the foreskin off her son to save Moses' life. Same thing. The child also is born to you shall surely die. 
the Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to, and I'm sorry, it became you. I read that, yeah. Then on the seventh day, it, be, it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of the day of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For well, they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. So, here's the good voice. We read the good voice earlier. What was the good voice? Did you remember? It was in Ezekiel 18, 20 to 23. It says, this is God's voice. Ezekiel's just writing, not knowing what's what, right? The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father. Nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall upon be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a man turns from all his sins which he has commanded keeps my statutes and and does what is lawful and right he shall surely live he shall not die the righteousness which he has done he shall live do i have any pleasure at all that the wicked uh, should die says the lord and not that and not that he should turn from his his ways and live now James 1.13 says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So here we go, another another account. Again the anger of the Lord was aroused. This is 2 Samuel 24, 1-15. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. He moved David against them. So the Lord was angry. He aroused. He was angry against Israel. He moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from morning till the appointed time. From Dan to Bathsheba, 70,000 of the people died. And this is a, a, not a good voice. This is a temptation coming from Yahweh uh, to David. And, and in, a, in a sense, he did something he shouldn't have done, and it cost them 70,000. It cost him 70,000 people because I was struck with an illness. It seems to be an MO for him. But notice the, the parallel account. Centuries later, Chronicles is written. And notice what is then said uh, in. First Chronicles 21, 1 Chronicles 21:1-14. Now this helps you to see who Yahweh is. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and seventy thousand men of Israel fell. It's verbatim, verbatim these accounts, but they're centuries apart. Deuteronomy 28:63 again. This is not the father's voice but well let's read it and it shall be that just as the lord rejoiced over you to do you sorry you to do you good and multiply you so the lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing and sh and you shall be plucked from from off the land which you got you go to possess now, let me tell you something man I would be ticked off, you know, if I was uh, in the nation of Israel. Had I seen all the fine print, you know, all I got was powerful displays, the all demonstrating how powerful this God is, and they were pretty gruesome, right? Really killed off the other nation. Uh, I got the Ten Commandments up front. I didn't know all the rest of the 603 laws. And if I, if in the end, if I had gone through it with a legal person, because these were all legally um, worded in such a way that just a, a lay person would have struggled to understand the implications of each law, and then be told that, what I just read to you in Deuteronomy, you know, um, yeah, yeah, the Lord will multiply you, but at the same time will pretty much cut you off. 
and pluck you from the land which you possess. I mean, and all the curses that went along with it. I mean, I, I, I'd really, I would just want him to go away, to be quite honest with you. I don't want that type of God in my life. Right? Would you? Honestly. I mean, if you're serious, if you're a serious investor, and someone said, well, here's the fine print, here's, here's all the, the details, the 603 laws in this contract, are you good to go with that? Your lawyers would say, mate, <laughs> think twice, right? Before you sign off. I don't think you can manage. That's what they would have probably said. And this is not a good investment for your health, right? We've got time for a bit more. Let's do a little bit more, friends. I, uh, I could, I could go on for a couple of more, but maybe we might leave the rest for another time. But we start to see, you know, the idea of doing this exercise is just to, you know, rightly divide the words and the voice that you're reading in the text. Um, we might, yeah, I might leave it at there and, and just make this part one, right? So let's do a part two uh, on rightly dividing. And we might look at something that Jesus says, um, some of the good things, some of the troublesome things. We're going to look a little bit at Revelation, some of the plagues in Revelation and the wrath of Revelation. Uh, just temporarily just going to go over it just sort of you know like uh, like an overview if you like so this is a bit, bit of an overview of things and uh, it, it'll help help you I hope as it helps me to try and understand what's going on but that's just something for you as well so that's our talk today guys on time to hate and time to love did you pick the differences out in the first part as we read through? Who was speaking and who wasn't? Who was Yahweh, the big G, and the little G? <laughs> we, should, we should do something about that one. Big G and little G. Alright guys, take care. We'll talk to you soon. See you later.